So it's so nice to be doing regular work with artists again in the studio. It's been a crazy seven months or so. And over the past four to six weeks, I've finally started to do regular tracking sessions or production sessions with artists. That being said, I immediately realized that I need to redo a vocal tracking template. So that's what I've done. And I wanted to take a moment to talk about some of the decisions that I've made and also some of my philosophies with templates in general. Back maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I had a template for everything when I was working in Pro Tools. In fact, I loved creating templates. The only problem is I went nuts with my templates and I went through so many different variables of tracks that I could potentially have needed that in some cases, it was almost like I was wasting time. It was so much quicker to do things from scratch. That being said though, there are certain things that you might end up using all the time. And then that is very useful to have in a template. Okay, so let's go over some of these decisions that I've made with uh, Studio One over here. Also worth noting that this template was created as a regular song. So if I open up a finder window and I scroll to my songs folder, and this is based on the default install pass of Studio One, I have a subfolder that I created called templates and I have a bunch of templates in here. Not that many, just stuff that I do where I do need to have a template. That's where this song for now is living. Okay. So let's get started here. If you're doing something simple, like a lead guitar where you're tracking also a vocal maybe in real time and it's a live off the floor, there's a good chance that you're only gonna have one vocal track and then probably a direct guitar track or something like that. And then the vocal verse, the bridge, the chorus, everything will be sung on one track. That's totally cool. You could have a lead vocal scratch track in there if you want, but more often than not, I end up separating the tracks for different processing on the individual elements. So for like example, the lead vocals on the verse versus the chorus, they may have maybe similar, but slightly different. Also, they may have different dynamics. So for that reason, I have some different tracks over here. I've got lead vox verse. The main reason I say vox instead of vocals is because uh, it's just a short form for me. And also I use the fader port 16 and I can read that on the label. So I try to make my track names so that they show up and I can read them while I'm looking at the fader port. So lead vox verse, lead vox chorus. Anytime I'm tracking vocals, uh, especially in pop, I'm always doubling the chorus whenever I can. And also most times I try to work in stereo pairs, even if I end up omitting one of them and I just use one, like I maybe only need, maybe I have a, a, a vocal double that happens over the verse and it's only in mono and I just tuck it in underneath in the center right underneath. But most of the time I will track in pairs. Now I also have a lead vocal track for the bridge or the middle eight. Maybe I'm gonna be doing a completely different signal chain or microphone. Anytime I have vocals, we always have, usually have a vox high harm. Again, left and right stereo pairs, vox low harm, uh, left and right stereo pairs. And then I've got four kind of miscellaneous background vocals. This could be for anything. Could be for uh, a, an, a simulated octave lower, or it could be uh, sung an octave lower or an octave higher, maybe a unison track, who knows. Then I have ad-libs, whether I'm doing pop, hip hop, there's always ad-libs. I've got a stereo pair there. If I need more, and if I'm not using one of these, it's very easy for me to just pop one of these into record mode. Now, another thing I've done is I've consciously made an effort to fit all of these on 16 tracks. That's because I've got a fader port 16 and I very much want to try to keep this to not having to bank over all the time. I wanna be able to see everything and I'm using colors that are against each other that stand out um, so that I can make out, for example, these two ad lib tracks, they're yellow. I should be able to see that on my select buttons. The same with these doubles, I should be able to see that. I will group these into colors and I might change these on the fly, but I've just done some basic work. Now, in addition to that, let's talk about these three effects returns. The only time you will ever see effects returns in your arrange window is if you go into advanced and automation, if you have automatically create automation tracks for channels. If this preference is enabled, you will see this. I came from Pro Tools. I am 100% used to seeing my effects returns available as a track with an automation line. And also if my inspector is open, I also have access to their fader, their trim, the sends if I want to, and even the plugins. So sometimes I'll work with the inspector open and the console closed. I like having those there. All right, let's bring in the console. 
First thing you'll notice is that all of these tracks are set to one common input. I have a default signal chain that I use. Now I've got lots of outboard gear, different preamps that are connected to my system. I'm running a Quantum with a Quantum 4848. It's my main rig for mixing and mastering. It's got lots of hardware connected to it. Also, I've got a patch bay, but basically I'm using either um, my RC500 uh, Personas solid state preamp or one of my four different two preamps, uh, Universal Audio Solo 610, my ADL700 or the Stereo ADL600. From there, that's manually patched into an 1176, then into a Pultec. I'm doing a tiny bit of compression and EQ on the way in. When I say a small amount, I mean, I might be knocking off one to two dBs on the 1176. And then if a singer was to really lean in and barrel into a mic, then it might hit, you know, three, maybe five dBs. But I'm doing a very gentle, small amount and it's gentle compression. And in terms of EQ, we're talking about on the Pultec, either set to one or two with a really high bandwidth and anywhere from like 8K to 16K. And I might give something a little bit of body if it sounds thin, but it's just general sculpting to get things in sounding better. So it's my default signal chain, and that's where all the tracks are set to start. Now you'll notice over here, I've got a talkback mic. This is for um, myself. It's the same mic that I'm speaking into right now. And it also has an instance of Mutomatic on it. This is something that I use all the time when tracking, uh, especially if you need control over talkback systems or effects returns. I have a video I've done. I'm going to make sure I link that in the info card up above. It's an absolutely amazing plugin. Now, I don't go crazy in terms of effects returns. I have a Valhalla Vintage Verb. I've just pulled down the decay a little bit from its default setting. I have a Waves H delay, just set to a quarter note, um, which is synced to the host BPM. And then I've got an instance of Sound Toys Micro Shift, just for a little bit of width if I need it. These are also followed by an instance of Mutomatic. This goes back to what I was talking about in the video, but basically this Mutomatic plugin will allow me to basically kill all these effects returns when the transport isn't stopped because I don't like having conversations with people when there's ping pong delays and big reverbs that are swimming around their voice. But then the minute we're either playing or recording, you will hear these effects returns uh, coming in as usual. Next up. This is something that uh, I've put in here, even though I don't do this uh, type of work that much anymore. I used to do a lot of work where I was just doing vocal tracking. I also used to do a ton of hip hop back maybe 2008 to 2011. I would get in, it could be anything, it could be an instrumental or a wave file. It was always too loud. And the first thing I always did was pull it down 10 or 20 dB on the fader. So I'm actually using the gain input trims on the Studio One console for this. This is brilliant because it allows me to leave the resolution of my fader at the zero mark. And um, I can really kind of dial in the instrumental against the music if I need to. But 99% of the time, I'm usually working with stems or I'm doing the production myself. So... Let's talk about a few other things. I also have this track in here, which is something that I just added right before doing this video. I like to work with tape style mode on, and that's a very specific uh, recording mode. And the reason I use this is because I use Green Z all the time with the Quantum. Now, when the track is playing, it's cutting off the live input. So I'm working on a workaround where I basically am using Mutomatic again um, and these awesome buttons that allow you to have control over the signal based on the transport. But I won't get into that too much. That's not really important. Uh, ideally, though, like I said, I want to keep these to the first 16 faders so I can work on kind of just one bank of the fader port. When we take a look at these, we have some basic color coding. The last thing I want to talk about is the sends and potential plugins. So you can't really see them now, but if I pull these up, you'll notice that each one of these has a send. Now it's activated, but is pulled all the way down. This is mainly because of the way the fader port works. With the fader port, there's currently no way to activate and deactivate these sends per track. Rather than me having to take my hands off the fader port and come in and activate and deactivate these, I just have this, for example, all the sends are activated and they're on, but they're not turned up. Now, if I want to turn them up, it's very easy for me to go into my sends view, from my track view into my sends view in my fader port. And now I can dial up the verb, I can dial up the delay, and I can dial up the micro shift, and I can even do this all together. And depending on what view 
I want to work in. I could do these for multiple selected tracks too. So I like working this way, but I don't want to see them if I don't need to. So that's why they're kind of hidden and out of the way. Now I'm not making any crazy decisions with these effects. These are very, very basic things that are just kind of there for if the artist wants to hear some effects. Now let's talk about plugins for a second, because I've seen some people's templates, um, and I've even downloaded some templates before from uh, from other places and had a look to see how other people were doing things. And I've opened up, you know, a, a basic template, and I've seen like six or seven plugins that are activated on each one of these tracks. And then, you know, you would watch the video and somebody would say, yeah, this, this template is very easy to use, but one thing you got to do is every time, you know, you move to a new track, you have to make sure that you adjust the EQ and the compressor and the de and the limiter and the reverb that's in line and the delay that's in line. For me, that's way too much. When I'm doing vocal tracking, I want all of my effort to be on keeping the vocalist happy, keeping them in the moment, making sure that I'm running things properly and that I'm working at the same speed um, and keeping up with their vibe and making sure that their headphone mix and everything is good. I don't have time or I, I don't really want to complicate things for myself that much that I have like five plugins on each one of these tracks. Now, granted, it's not 100% fair because I'm using, you know, an outboard hardware preamp that goes into a compressor that goes into an EQ and then it's coming into Studio One to be recorded. But guess what? Even if I wasn't doing that, and even if I was doing that where I wanted to have the same approach, I could come into any one of these channels here that I'm recording, like, you know, input to, and I could just grab a fat channel and I could do something really gentle. I could come in and choose one of my emulations. I actually love this particular compressor. And in terms of the EQ, um, any one of these ones, they sound great. You could use the, the built-in ones, or if you buy one of these add-on packages, I could use anything here. Maybe I'll get like a Helios EQ and dial in something. I could do basically the same where I'm just knocking off a couple dBs with maybe a, you know, a slow attack, fast released on my compressor. And then this wouldn't be anything excessive. This would be maybe I'm giving like a 2 dB boost at, at, a, at a certain frequency, right? So you could totally have the same approach to that. And you could leave this live on your input. Now, that being said, um, another approach that one could take is that, like I said, I don't want to stack up four or five or, th or six plugins. I want to keep this really, really simple. Well, then what I might consider doing is putting the actual fat channel on here because it's zero latency. And I would put this at a decent starting point. So I wouldn't go ahead and try to dial in everything and, and use stuff that's super fancy. I would basically say, boom, okay, you know what? Let me put like, I don't know, an 85 hertz high pass filter. The compressor, let me activate it, but I'm not going to actually adjust the threshold because I don't know what that is yet. Uh, I might move this up to like four to one or maybe something like three to one. And this, I would just leave this all alone. I probably wouldn't even use any makeup gain. So the compressor is activated and all I have to do when the signal comes in, in fact, let me mute this track and let's just change this just for a second. And if I was to go like this, uh, I could just adjust this as I'm going, you know, I could just pull this down. So the actual track, just to get some compression happening here and say, okay, well, that's the threshold. I'm just knocking off a little bit there. I don't want to do that now. Let's change this back to where it was. But yeah, this is the idea, is I would basically have this set up so that I only have to adjust the threshold. And here, if this is okay, I might even go to like, I might even back off to like 75 or 70 if I didn't want to overdo my high pass filter. And then in terms of the EQ, I would probably activate this, but not do any moves. I might actually, let's change this to a high shelf. So this is now activated, but I'm not giving any gain. And then if I need gain, only when I need gain would I would I attempt to adjust it while I'm tracking. And it would be something really simple that I could just kind of adjust and leave in place. And let's let's just reset these two nodes. So this is probably how I would leave this as a starting point. I would have it so that it's open and all of these could be adjusted really easily. I would leave it in this mode so that everything can be adjusted at once. Now I'm going to take all of these and remove them. Drag this over here. So now 
a fat channel is instantiated on every single one of these tracks and this has zero latency. It's very low in terms of a CPU hit. And then if I did need to adjust something and if I wanted something to be into heavier compression, then that's something I could do really easily by just pulling back the threshold and maybe even clicking auto or soft and giving this some gain, whatever I need. But for now, I am actually going to take all of these and I'll leave them on, but let's just bypass them. So we'll only use them if we need to. So this now is a great starting point. So now in terms of the way that I would use a template, 99% of the time I use import song data. What does this mean? This means that I have a new song that I've created. Let's just take something and I'm going to put this on the desktop for now. And in terms of the styles, this is just going to be an empty song. We'll leave everything as is, and I'm just going to create a new empty song. Now, if I had a song, and let's say I had a bunch of tracks, and I had some virtual instruments and everything, and I had done my production, and I wanted to track, it's so easy for me to import song data, navigate to this song that I've put in my templates folder, vocal tracking template, and then I say to myself, okay, what do I need from this song? Well, I want to Im import my whole shebang because I need everything, right? So let's take all of this. We just scroll down, we click OK. This is now going to bring in everything that I need. If I open up my mixer, because our IO setups match, these have all come in with the proper input. So these are all set to the, to, to the proper piece of gear in terms of our IO setup. All of this is set and ready to go. And I can just go ahead and start my vocal tracking session. That's the way that I like to work. The other option would be, close this, I don't need to save the changes to that either. The other option would be that if we save it as a template, because keep in mind, I just saved this as a regular song file, but if we save it as a template, give it a description and an icon, we click OK. Then when we do a new song, we have the option to actually start from that template. Now, if I do this, again, we're going to do the same thing. I'll just throw this on my desktop for now. This is going to start from this as a blank starting point. So now if I click OK, this is going to create a brand new song, and this is the starting point of the song. So now I would either drag in my stems or my two mix or whatever I need to do, and I would just immediately start recording. And this is set up exactly the way that I need. So build yourself a template, save it as an actual song in its own folder, and then from there, you can then also save it as a template. And then, like I say, if you made any changes, like let's say you said, you know what, 90% of the time I want these to be panned out, I might as well do that now, and I might as well make some adjustments to these levels. I'll pull some of these faders down. I don't know why you would pull faders down when you, when you can't hear anything yet. But if you did make any changes and you went to save as template, I can actually replace an existing song folder just by clicking it, and then it overwrites the original. So you can kind of update the song as you go. Anyways, that is my approach to a vocal tracking template. Feel free to take or leave anything you want from it. But that's all the time I've got available for today. I hope that you enjoyed this content. If you did, please consider hitting that subscribe button. Any questions or comments, leave them down below. I'll do my absolute best to get back to you. And as always, we will catch you in the next video. Cheers.